Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and blessed be God's kingdom, now and forever. My brothers and sisters, let us confess our sins to God. God of all mercy, we confess that we have sinned against you, opposing your will in our lives. We have denied the goodness in each other, in ourselves, and in the world you have created. We repent of the evil that enslaves us, the evil we have done and the evil done on our behalf. Forgive, restore, and strengthen us through our Savior Jesus Christ, that we may abide in your love and serve only your will. Amen. May Almighty God have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through the grace of Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in everlasting life. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O God, you declare your almighty power chiefly in showing mercy and having pity. Grant us the fullness of your grace, that we, running to obtain your promises, may become partakers of your heavenly treasure. Through Jesus Christ, our brother, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. A reading from Ezekiel. The word of the Lord came to me. What do you mean by repeating this proverb concerning the land of Israel? The parents have eaten sour grapes, and the children's teeth are set on edge. As I live, says the Lord God, this proverb shall no more be used by you in Israel. Know that all lives are mine. The life of the parent as well as the life of the child is mine. It is only the person who sins that shall die. Yet you say, the way of the Lord is unfair. Hear now, O Israel. Is my way unfair? Is it not your ways that are unfair? 
When the righteous turn away from their righteousness and commit inequity, they shall die for it. For the inequity that they have committed, they shall die. Again, when the wicked turn away from the wickedness they have committed and do what is lawful and right, they shall save their lives. Because they consider and turned away from all the transgressions that they have committed, they shall surely live, they shall not die. Yet the house of Israel says, the way of the Lord is unfair. O house of Israel, are my ways unfair? Is not your ways that are unfair? Therefore, I will judge you, O house of Israel, all of you according to your ways, says the Lord God. Repent and turn from all your transgressions, otherwise inequity will be your ruin. Cast away from you all the transgressions that you have committed against me, and get yourselves a new heart and a new spirit. Why will you die, O house of Israel? For I have no pleasure in the death of anyone, says the Lord God. Turn then and live. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. Thanks be to God. Let us recite the song of Simeon. Master, now you are dismissing your servant in peace, according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, for which you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people, Israel. A reading from Matthew. When Jesus entered the temple, the chief priest and the elders of the people came to him as he was teaching and said, By what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority? Jesus said to them, I will also ask you one question, if you will tell me the answer. Then I will also tell you by what authority I do these things. Did the baptism of John come from heaven, or was it of human origin? And they argued with one another. If we say from heaven, he will say to us, why then did you not believe him? But if we say of human origin, we are afraid of the crowd, for all regard John as a prophet. So they answered Jesus, we do not know. And he said to them, neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. What do you think? A man had two sons. He went to the first and said, son, go and work in the vineyard today. He answered, I will not. But later he changed his mind and went. The father went to the second and said to the same, said the same. And he answered, I go, sir. But he did not go. Which of the two did the will of his father? They said the first. Jesus said to them, truly, I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are going into the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes believed him. And even after you saw it, you did not change your minds and believe him. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. Thanks be to God. In the name of our loving, liberating, life-giving God. Amen. Now, Master, you may dismiss your servant in peace. We use the canticle of Simeon today as our canticle, our psalm for offering uh, back to God in the midst of the readings, a sense of gratitude for the abundant grace, for the hopeful presence, for the deep, liberating, and life-giving love that God has for all creation and for all people. We, this little green terrestrial ball in a vast cosmos, an unimaginably vast cosmos, have a capacity to connect to the other that is itself a gift of creation. And in the Christmas story, in the narratives of Jesus' birth, one by the name of Simeon, who had waited for the deliverance of Israel from all the bondage of the world, from all the oppression of the Roman Empire, all the empire elements that held back what he felt was the deep 
gift of God's Spirit in the witness of the Hebrew people was at the temple one day when Mary and Joseph, with a couple turtle doves, brought Jesus. And when he sees the child, he takes the child from her and prays. But the prayer is to God about the abundant goodness, the abundant gift in this baby for all people. Now, Master, you may dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen the glory of Israel and your people. And then he turns and says, For many will fall by his presence. And to Mary, he says, And a sword of sorrow will pierce your heart. Our gospel passage this week is a, cha- is a question and a tension over authority inside the temple between the uh, priest of the temple and Jesus. In the passage just before this, Jesus has tipped over the money tables. So these are, all, these are the stories that are coming at the end of the gospel, closer to Jesus' trial and crucifixion, his execution, his murder. How do I tie them together? Because Jesus, in growing into his sense of identity as the Son of God, and his sense of witness that all of us can live out of that same spirit of God will transform the perspective that we have in the world. And it will put us in conflict with the empire, with the establishment. And that it's our call as faithful Christians to continually reflect on how that spirit of God's working in us, not only personally, but communally, so that we might be maybe the first son who says, no, I'm not going to go. I'm not going to go pick your grapes, old man. They make me sour, and it's too hot. And later, the day goes, yeah, it's kind of a jerk off, and goes to the vineyard. Or the second son who says, yes, I'm on my way, and never quite gets there. I don't know. Bell wanted to hang for a while, chill, and the day just slipped by. The witness in the text is not so much of God casting judgment, but of God's continual invitation to draw us back and for us to lay down the things that get in the way of us being in communion, being in the presence of, being prayerful with, being transformed by God's Spirit that wells up within us, a free gift. So when they say to Jesus, by what authority do you do these things? Jesus will say, well, tell me, by what authority did John the Baptist baptize? And those who were questioning him, you know, kind of go off to the side and they go, well, geez. John's so popular and was so powerful in word and deed that if we say it was by God, then we got to back off him, off this Jesus. But if we say it wasn't, the crowds are going to get pretty upset. And that could threaten the peace of Jerusalem. And we have to manage the peace of Jerusalem against the empire, the legions, the emperor. And so they choose the answer, we don't know. Now in their fearful, compassionate, confused, and frustrated response to Jesus, he sees they're stuck. And in their stuckness, they're not opening up to the liberating witness that God will love us and carry us right through death, which is Jesus' ultimate witness. Now, I'm not exactly preaching that we all go out and pit ourselves against the authorities, against the police, against whichever federal agents are, or against the protesters who we may not agree with and end up dead. 
But I am saying we have to pit ourselves against our own stubbornness, our own resistance to change, to allow the Spirit of God to work through us. Those who challenged Jesus in the temple feared any change. Status quo was their modus operandi, and we were to live by that, or else the Romans might take the place apart. <coughs> Today, in this place. Oops, my mic microphone. Hang on, folks. I wear a mask here. Tom and I are the only two in the church, but we wear masks to protect each other. I can't tell you how many different reactions I've had when I wear a mask in public. So I did a little digging around to learn about why people seem to be in one or another direction with this. Why there seems to be almost a rage around a little piece of cloth or around a dollar semi-surgical mask. And oh, by the way, do you wear it with the blue out or the white out? There's an instinctual side in human psychology that we resist the change, we ignore whatever is the problem thing, and we just kind of try and do the regular thing. It ties into that fight or flight mode of existence. And the psychology gets pretty thorough and complicated. I won't go into all of that here, but I do think what's important for us as a faith community is to pause and in reflecting on how a mask can be a compassionate response to the world, we see where God's calling us to be compassion. And we see where we may be taken to places that we would be uncomfortable with, but yet able to help make change. Because even in our own minds, while the social order seems like it's worked out, there are those who tell us it's not. And how do we listen? And how are we present? And how do we change? Jesus tipped over the money tables and then asked the authorities to explain John. While they were angry, they were stuck. And Jesus then turned to the disciples and talked about the two sons who did and didn't go to the vineyard. We're all called to the vineyard. We're in the vineyard. The world is the vineyard. And we are here to help with the harvest. How do the gifts you have allow you to embrace the deep peace of God to transform the systems in our world that are of empire, of stasis and stuck and inequality and division and hatred, how are you here to help change those to the life-giving, the liberating, the loving presence of God that seeks equality, not only materially, but the dignity, equality of dignity amongst all people? It's the critical work we have. Matthew's gospel does not let us hide. We can always be called out because we're all sinners. But rather than being fearful or judgmental, fearful that I have sinned, judgmental on those who have sinned against me, better we take a knee and humbly raise up the words of Simeon. Now, Master, you can dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen in the smallest works of kindness, in the true speaking for other people's justice, the salvation of your people. Glory to God in the highest and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we pray.
sin of the world, have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father. Receive our prayer, for you alone are the Holy One. You alone are the Lord. You alone are the Most High. Jesus Christ with the Holy Spirit in the glory of God the Father. Amen. Let us confess our faith with the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray for the church and for the world. Forgiving God, you teach us not haughtiness, but true humility, that we may serve every human being with true equality. We praise your name. For the earth and its beauty, we praise your name. For the wisdom and commitment of leaders, we praise your name. For those with birthdays, Mark and Lisa, we praise your name. You are the source of solace in every need. For those who are sick or injured, Nancy, Mary, Susan, Cloyd, Haley, Linda, Joe, Patty, Mark, Mary, Sheena, Fritz, Jim, Jan, Sienna, Matthew, Mitch, John, Daryl, Doug, Diane, Anne, Susie, Chris, Michelle, Madri, and David, and those in continuing care. Lord, hear our prayer. Come to the aid of all who suffer, especially for those throughout the world without access to health care, sanitation, or the ability to quarantine. Give peace and understanding between all people and all races. Lead us to love all as you love all. Lord, hear our prayer. Give us the will to provide for all those in need, especially the ones suffering from hardship following the severe weather and fires. Lord, hear our prayer. For those who have died and those who mourn, especially the family of Jean Church. Lord, hear our prayer. Give your grace to all we name before you. Lord, hear our prayer. Compassionate, merciful, and ever-present. In this service today, we have lifted up our gratitude for your mercy and for your gift of change. Help us to set aside our haughtiness that idolizes our own ideas and help us to walk with the humility that insight comes through the relationship of the community and by your divine grace. We ask this in Jesus' name. It is that blessed moment in our service where we dig into our pockets and try to support the mission of God in this world in this place called Christ Church. Whether you want to specifically support loaves and fishes, the Ecumenical Community Center Foundation, a mission within here on formation, or the church in general, I thank you for your contributions. 
And for the many of you who have sustained those contributions over these eight months of COVID, it won't go away quickly, but neither will we. Life can be difficult, life can be tough, but you, my dears, are just as tough. Let us continue to work for the kingdom. As our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Let us bow our heads and pray God's blessing. In the moments of instability, in the moments of insecurity, in the moments of frustration and anger, God speaks a word of hope. God spoke Jesus into being through the yes of Mary. Simeon blessed Jesus for all of us and pointed to the light of the world. That light dwells in you. Never forget and never doubt. And may the blessing of Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you now and forever. Amen. Serve the Lord. Alleluia. Alleluia.